The following is a conversation with Vladimir Vapnik. He's the co-inventor of support vector machines, support vector clustering, VC theory, and many foundational ideas in statistical learning. He was born in the Soviet Union and worked at the Institute of Control Sciences in Moscow. Then, in the United States, he worked at AT&T, NEC Labs, Facebook Research, and now is a professor at Columbia University. His work has been cited over 170,000 times. He has some very interesting ideas about artificial intelligence and the nature of learning, especially on the limits of our current approaches and the open problems in the field. This conversation is part of MIT course on artificial general intelligence and the artificial intelligence podcast. If you enjoy it, please subscribe on YouTube or rate it on iTunes or your podcast provider of choice, or simply connect with me on Twitter or other social networks at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D. And now, here's my conversation with Vladimir Vapnik. Einstein famously said that God doesn't play dice. Yeah. You have studied the world through the eyes of statistics, so let me ask you in terms of the nature of reality, fundamental nature of reality, does God play dice? You don't know some factors. And because you don't know some factors, which could be important, it looks like God play dice, but we don't. We should describe it. In philosophy, they distinguish between two positions: positions of instrumentalism, where you creating theory for prediction, and position of realism, where you trying to understand what God did. Can you describe instrumentalism and realism a little bit? For example. If you have some mechanical laws, what is that? Is it law which true always and everywhere? Or it is law which allow you to predict position of moving element? The, what, what you believe? You believe that it is God's law, that God created the world, which obey to this physical law, yeah. or it is just law for predictions. And which if, one is instrumentalism? For predictions. Just if predictions. you believe that this is law of God, and it's always true everywhere, that means that you're realist. So you're you, trying to re the reality, uh, understood, understand the God thought. So the way you see the world is, is as an instrumentalist? You know, Perhaps I'm or? working for some models, model of uh, machine learning. So in this model, we can see uh, setting, and we try to solve, resolve the setting, to solve the problem. And you can do it in two different ways, from the point of view of instrumentalism, and that's what everybody does now, because uh, they say that goal of machine learning is to uh, find the rule for classification. Mm -hmm. That is true, but it is instrument for prediction. But I can say the goal of uh, machine learning is to, to learn about conditional probability, so how God played use and he, is he play, what is probability for one, what is probability for another given situation. But for prediction, I don't need this. I need the rule. Yeah. But for understanding, I need conditional probability. So let me just step back a little bit first to talk about, you mentioned, uh, which I read last night, the, the parts of the 1960 paper by Eugene uh, Wigner. Yeah. Uh, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural sciences. Such a such a beautiful paper. Yeah, by the absolutely. way, it made me feel, to be honest, to confess my own work in the past few years on deep learning, heavily applied, made me feel that I was missing out on some of the beauty of nature in, in the way that math can uncover. So let me just step away from the, the poetry of that for a second. How do you see the role of math in your life? Is it, is it a tool? Is it poetry? Where, where does it sit? And does math for you have limits? 
of what it can describe. Some people saying that Mars is language which use God. So I believe and exactly. speak to God or use God or use God. Use God. Yeah. So I believe that this article about effectiveness, unreasonable effectiveness of mass, is that if you're looking at mathematical structures, they know something about reality. And the most scientists from natural science, they're looking on equation and trying to understand reality. So the same in machine learning. If you trying very carefully look on all equations which define conditional probability, you can understand something about reality more than from your fantasy. So math can reveal the simple underlying principles of reality, perhaps. You know what means simple? It is very hard to discover them. But then when you discover them and look at them, you see how beautiful they are. And, and it is surprising why people did not see that before you're looking on equation and derive it from equations. For example, I talked yesterday mm -hmm. about least square method. Mm -hmm. And people had a lot of fantasy how to improve least square method. But if you look going step by step by solving some equations, you suddenly will get some term which, after thinking, you understand that it describes position of observation point. In least square method, we throw out a lot of information. We don't look in composition of point of observations. We're looking only on residuals. Mm -hmm. But when you understood that, that's a very simple idea, but it's not too simple to understand. And you can derive this just from equations. So some simple algebra, so a few steps will take you to something surprising that when Absolutely, you think about, yes. you so understand. Yeah, and that is proof that human intuition not to reach and very primitive. And it does not see very simple situations so uh, let me take a step back in, in general in, in yes right uh but what about human as opposed to intuition ingenuity um the moments of brilliance so uh, are you so uh do you have to be so hard on human intuition are there moments of brilliance in human intuition that can leap ahead of math and then the math will catch up I don't think so. I think that the, the best human intuition, it is putting in axioms. And then it is technical way. See how where the axioms it. take you. Yeah. But so, if they correctly take axioms, but it axiom polished during generations of scientists. And this is integral wisdom. So <laughs> that's beautifully put. But if you uh, maybe look at when you when you think of Einstein and uh, special relativity, you know, what is the role of imagination coming first there in the moment of discovery of an idea? So there's obviously a mix of math and out of the box imagination there. That's I don't know. Whatever I did. I exclude any imagination because whatever I saw in machine learning that come from imagination, like features, mm -hmm. like deep learning, mm -hmm. they are not relevant to the problem. When you're looking very carefully from mathematical equations, you're deriving very simple theory, which goes far beyond theoretically than whatever people can imagine because it is not good fantasy. Yeah. It is just interpretation, it is just fantasy, but it is not what you need. You don't need any imagination to derive, uh, say, main principle of machine learning. 
it, when you think about learning and intelligence, maybe thinking about the human brain and trying to describe mathematically the process of learning, uh, that is something like what happens in the human brain. Do you think we have the tools currently? Do you think we will ever have the tools to try to describe that process of learning? You, it is not description of what's going on. It is interpretation. It is your interpretation. Your vision can be wrong. You know, when guy invent microscope, mm -hmm. Levin Gook, for the first time, only he got this instrument and nobody, only he kept secret about this microscope. But he wrote a report in London Academy of Science. And in his report, when he looking at the blood, he looked everywhere, on the water, on the blood, on the spin. But he described blood like fight mm -hmm. between queen and king. Mm -hmm. So he saw blood cells, red cells, and he imagined that it is army fighting each other. And it was his interpretation of situation. And he sent it, this report in Academy of Science. They uh, very carefully looked because they believe that he is right. He is right. He saw something. Yes. But he gave wrong interpretation. And I believe the same can happen with his brain. With because brain, yeah. The most important part, you know, I believe in human language. In some proverb is so much wisdom. For example, people say that it is better than a thousand days of diligent studies one day with great teacher. But if it, I will ask you what teacher does, nobody knows. And that is intelligence. And But we know from history and uh, now from, from mass and machine learning that teacher can do a lot. So what, from a mathematical point of view, is the great teacher? I don't know. That's an open question. There, no, no, no. Uh, but we can uh, say what teacher can do. He can introduce some uh, invariants, some predicate for creating invariants. How he doing it? I don't know because teacher knows reality and can describe from this reality a predicate invariants. But we know that when you're using invariant, you can decrease number of observations hundred times. That's uh, so. But <laughs> uh, maybe try to pull that apart a little bit. I think you mentioned uh, like a piano teacher saying uh, uh, to the student, "Play like a butterfly." Yeah. Right? I played piano, I played in guitar for a long time. And, and it, yeah, that's, there's, um, maybe it's romantic, poetic, but it feels like there's a lot of truth in that statement. Like there's, there is a lot of instruction in that statement. And so can, can you pull that apart? What is, what, what is that? The language itself may not contain it is, this information. It's not blah, blah, blah. Because it is not blah, 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 yeah. Effect you. It's what? Effect you. Yeah. Affect your playing. Yes, it does, but what? It's not the lang. It's I, if it feels like a. Um, what is the information being exchanged there? What What is the nature of information? What is the representation of that information? I believe that it is sort of predicate, but I don't know. That Some is kind of exactly what what intelligence in machine learning should be. Yes, because the rest is just mathematical technique. I think that uh, what was discovered recently is that. There is two type, two mechanism of learning. Uh, one called strong convergence mechanism mm -hmm. and weak convergence mechanism. Before people use only one convergence. In weak convergence mechanism, you can use predicate. That's what play like butterfly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will immediately affect your playing. You know, this, there is English proverb, great. Mm -hmm. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quack like a duck, then it is probably duck. Yes. But this is exact about predicates. Looks like a duck, what it means. So you saw many ducks that your training data. So you, you have description of how, how 
looks integral looks ducks yeah the visual characteristics of uh, a duck yeah uh, yeah but you want and you have model for the cognition dots so you would like so that theoretical description from model coincide with empirical description which you saw on tail text there. Mm-hmm. so about looks like a duck it is general but what about swims like a duck you should know the duck swims you can say it play chess like a duck okay duck does not play chess and it is completely legal predicate but it is useless so half teacher can recognize not useless predicate so up to now we don't use this predicate in existing machine learning and you think so that's, why that's we need so zillions necessary. of data <clears throat> but in this english proverb Proverbs, they use only three predicates. Looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quack like a duck. So you can't deny the fact that swims like a duck and quacks like a duck has humor in it, has ambiguity. Let's talk about swim like a duck. In It does not say jumps, jump like, like a duck. Why? Because... It's not relevant. Uh... But that means that you know ducks you know different birds you know animals yeah. and you derive from this that it is relevant to say swim like a duck so duck. But underneath in order for us to understand swims like a duck it feels like we need to know millions of other little pieces of information I'm which not sure we pick that. up along the way you don't think so there no. doesn't need to be this knowledge base in in those statements carries some rich information that helps us understand the essence of duck yeah how far are we from integrating uh predicates no in- you know that when when you consider complete theory of machine learning yeah. so what it does you have a lot of functions and then you you're, you're talking it looks like a duck you see your training data from training data you recognize like uh, expected duck should look mm-hmm. then you remove all functions which does not look like you think it should look from training data so you decrease amount of function from which we, you pick up one then you give a second predicate and again decrease, decrease the set of function and after that you you pick up the best function you can find it is standard machine learning so why you need not too many examples because your predicates aren't very good <laughs> or, or yeah, you're that's, not that means the predicate very good yeah because every predicate is invented to decrease admissible set of function So you talk about admissible set of functions and you talk about good functions. So what makes a good function? So admissible set of function is set of function which has small capacity or small diversity, small VC dimension example, mm-hmm. which contain good function inside. So by the way, for people who don't know, VC, uh, you're the V in the VC. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, how would you describe to a layperson what VC theory is? Uh, how would you describe so VC? you have a machine, <coughs> so machine capable to pick up one function from the admissible set of function. Mm-hmm. But set of admissible function can be big. Say, so contain all continuous functions and it's useless. You don't have so many examples to pick up function, but it can be small, small. Uh, we call it capacity, but maybe it's better called diversity. So not very different function in the set is infinite set of function, but not very diverse. So it is small VC dimension. When VC dimension is small, you need not you, you need small amount of training data. So the goal is to create admissible set of functions which is have small VC dimension and contain good function. Then you should 
then you will be able to pick up the function uh, using small amount of observations. So that is the task of uh, learning. Yeah. Is creating a set of admissible functions that has a small VC dimension. And then you figure out a clever way of picking up no, the that, good. that is goal of learning, which I formulated yesterday. Yeah. Statistical learning theory does not involve in creating admissible set of function. In classical learning theory, everywhere, hundred percent in textbook, the set of function, admissible set of function is given. Mm-hmm. But this is science about nothing, because the most difficult problem to create admissible set of functions given, say, a lot of functions, continuum set of functions, create admissible set of functions, that means that it has finite VC dimension, small VC dimension, and contain good function. So this was out of consideration. So, so how, what's the process of doing that? I mean, it's fascinating. What is the process of creating this um, admissible set of functions? That is invariant. That's invariance. Can you yeah. describe invariance? Yeah, you you're, you're looking here. of properties of training data, and uh, properties means that you uh, say have some function, and you 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 just count what is value average value of function on training data. <coughs> you have model and what is the expectation of this function on the model. Mm-hmm. And they should coincide. So the the problem is about how to pick up functions. It can be any function. It uh, in, in in fact it, it it is true for all functions. But because when I talking that, uh, say, um, duck does not jumping, mm-hmm. so you don't ask question jump like a duck, because it is trivial. It does not jumping and does not help you to recognize jump. But you know something, which question to ask, and you asking it swims like a jump, like a duck, but looks like a duck at this general situation. Mm-hmm. Looks like, say, guy who have this illness, is this disease, it, it is legal. Yeah. So there is a, a general type of predicate looks like, yeah. and specific, special type of predicate, which related to this specific problem. And that is intelligence part of all this business. And that where teacher is involved. Incorporating the specialized predicates. Uh, yeah. Okay. What do you think about deep learning as as um, neural networks, these arbitrary architectures, as helping accomplish some of the tasks you're thinking about? Their effectiveness or lack thereof? What are, what are the weaknesses and what are the possible strengths? You know, I think that this is fantasy. Everything which, like deep learning, like features. Let me give you this example. Uh, one of the greatest books, this Churchill book about history of Second World War. Mm-hmm. And he's starting this book describing that in all time, when war is over, so the great kings, they gather together, and most all of them were relatives, and they discussed what should be done, how to create peace. And they came to agreement. And when, ca- when happens First World War, the general public came in power. And they were so greedy that robbed Germany. Mm-hmm. And it was clear for everybody that it is not peace. That peace will last only 20 years because they was not professionals. And the same I see in machine learning. Mm-hmm. There are mathematicians who are looking for the problem from a very deep point of view, of mathematical point of view. And there are uh, computer scientists mm-hmm. with mostly does not know mathematics. They just have interpretation of that. 
and they invented a lot of blah 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 interpretations like deep learning. Why you need deep learning? Mathematics does not know deep learning. Mathematics does not know uh, neurons. It is just function. Just, If you like yeah. to say piecewise linear function, say that, and do in ca in class of piecewise linear function. But they invent something, and then they try to 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 prove advantage of that through interpretations, yeah. which mostly wrong. And when it, the it, not and enough, the they, they appeal to brain, which they know nothing about that. Nobody knows what's going on in the brain. So I think that more reliable, look on mass. This is mathematical problem. Do your best to solve this problem. Try to understand that there is no only one way of convergence, mm -hmm. which is strong way of convergence. There is a weak way of convergence, which requires predicate. And if you will go through all this stuff, you will see that you don't need deep learning. Even more, I would say one of the theorem, which called representer theory, mm -hmm. it says that optimal solution of mathematical problem, which is which described learning, mm -hmm. is on shadow network. In not on deep learning and a shallow network yeah yeah the ultimate problem network. is there yeah. absolutely so in the end what you're saying is exactly right the question is you have no value for throwing something on the table playing with it not math it's like a neural network where you said uh, throwing something in the bucket and or um By bio, the biological example and looking at kings and queens with the cells with a microscope you don't see value in imagining the cells or kings and queens and using that as inspiration and imagination for where the math will eventually lead you? You, you think that interpretation First basically all, deceives you in a way that's not productive? I think that uh, if you're trying to analyze uh, this the nature business of learning, of learning yeah. Uh, and and especially discussion about deep learning, it is discussion about interpretation, not about things, about what you can say about things. That's right. But aren't you about surprised words. by the beauty of it? So the th the uh, uh, not mathematical beauty, but the fact that it works at all, or are you criticizing that very beauty? Our human desire to <laughs> to interpret. To, to find our silly inter silly interpretations in these constructs. Like, let me ask you this. Are you surprised and th does it inspire you? How do you feel about the success of a system like AlphaGo at beating the game of Go? Using uh, neural networks to estimate the, the quality of a, bo of a board and, and, and the quality of the position. That is your interpretation, quality of the board. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it works. So it's not our interpretation. The fact is, a neural network system doesn't matter. A learning system that we don't, I think, mathematically understand that well beats the best human player. Does something that was thought impossible. That means that it's not a very difficult problem. That's, that's it. That's so you empiric. We've empirically have discovered that this is not a very difficult problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true uh so maybe it's, uh <laughs> can't argue uh so w even more i would yeah. say that if they use deep learning it is not the most effective way of learning theory and usually when people use deep learning they're using zillions of training data Yeah, yeah, but you don't need this. It so I describe challenge. Can we do some problems which do it well? Deep learning method with deep net uh, using 100 times less training data. Even more, some problems deep learning cannot solve because it's not necessary they create admissible set of function when they to create deep architecture means to create admissible set of functions 
You cannot say that you're creating good admissible set of functions. Yeah, you you're just, it's your fantasy. It is not comes from mass. But it is possible to create admissible set of functions because you have your training data. It actually, for mathematicians, uh, when you consider invariant, you need to use law of large numbers. When you're making training in existing algorithm, you need uniform law of large numbers, mm -hmm. which is much more difficult. It requires VC dimension and all this stuff. But nevertheless, if you use balls, weak and strong way of convergence, you can decrease a lot of training data. Yeah, you could do the, the three, the swims like a duck uh, and quacks like a duck. Yeah, yeah. But our, so let, let's, let's step back and um, think about intel human intelligence in general. I mean, clearly that has evolved in a non-mathematical way. <laughs> <laughs> it, w it wasn't, uh, as far as we know, uh, God uh, or, or, or whoever didn't uh, come up with a model uh, and place it in our brain of admissible functions. It kind of evolved. I don't know, maybe you have a view on this. but So Alan Turing in the 50s, in his paper, uh, asked and rejected the question, can machines think? It's not a very useful question, but can you briefly entertain this useful question? useless question can machines think so talk about intelligence and your view of it i don't know that i know that turing describe imitation if computer can imitate human being let's call it intelligent and he understands that it is not thinking computer yes he he completely understand what he doing yes. but he set up problem of imitation. So now we understand that the problem not in imitation. I'm not sure that intelligence just inside of us. It may be also outside of us. I have several observations. So when I prove some theorem, mm -hmm. it's very difficult theory. Uh, in a couple of years, in several places, People prove the same theorem, say, Sawyer Lemma, after us was done, then another guy proved the same theorem. In the history of science, it's happened all, all the time. For example, geometry. Mm -hmm. It's happened simultaneously. First it did Lobachevsky, and then uh, Gauss, and Boyayi, and another guys. And it approximately in 10 times period, 10, 10 years period of time. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of examples like that. And many mathematicians think that when they develop something, mm -hmm. they develop something in general which affect everybody. Mm -hmm. So maybe our model that intelligence is only inside of us is incorrect. It's our interpretation. Yeah. It may be <laughs> there exists some connection this yeah. world intelligence. I don't know. That. You're almost like plugging in into... Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and contributing to this... Into a uh, big network. Into, into a big... Uh, maybe a neural network. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> on the flip side of that, maybe you can comment on uh, big O complexity and how you see classifying algorithms by worst case running time in relation to their input. So that way of thinking about functions, do you think P equals NP? Do you think that's an interesting question? Yeah, it is an interesting question. But let me talk about complexity in about worst case scenario. There is a mathematical setting. When I came to United States in 1990, so People did not know this is theory, they did not know statistical learning theory. So in Russia it was published two monographs, our monographs, but in America they did not know. Then they learned it, and somebody told me that it is worst case theory and they will create real case theory, but till now it did not. Because it is mathematical tool. You can do only what you can do using mathematics and which has a clear understanding mm -hmm. and clear description. 
And for this reason, we introduce complexity. And we need this because using Actually, it is diversity, I like this one more. You see the mention, you can prove some theorems. But we also create theory for case when you know probability measure. And that is the best case which can happen. It is entropy theory. So from mathematical point of view, you know the best possible case and the worst possible case. You can derive different model in minimum. But it's not so interesting. You think the edge ca- the edges are interesting? The edges is interesting. Because it is not so easy to get good bound, exact bound. It's not many cases where you have the bound is not exact. But interesting principles which discover mm. the mass. Do you think it's interesting because it's challenging and reveals interesting principles that allow you to get those bounds? Or do you think it's interesting because it's actually very useful for understanding the essence of a function, of a, of an algorithm? Uh, so <laughs> it's like me judging your life as a human being by the worst thing you did and the best thing you did versus all the stuff in the middle. It seems uh, not productive. I don't think so, because you cannot describe situation in the middle, or it will be not general. So you can describe edge cases, and it is clear it has some model, but you cannot describe model for every new case. So you will be never accurate when you're using model. But from a statistical point of view, the way you've studied uh, functions and and the nature of learning and the world, don't you think that the real world has a very long tail? That the edge cases are very far away from the mean? <laughs> the, the stuff in the middle? Or no? I don't know that. Because I think that but from my point of view, if you will use formal statistics, mm-hmm. you need <coughs> uniform law of large numbers. If you will use this invariance business, you will need just law of large numbers. You don't, and, and there's a huge difference between uniform law of large numbers and large numbers. Is it useful to describe that a little more, or should we just take it to? No, for example, when when I talking about duck, I gave three predicates and that was enough. But if you will try to to do formal, distinguish, you will need a lot of observation. I got you, uh, and. So that means that information about looks like a duck contain a lot of bit of information, formal bits of information. So we don't know that how much bit of information contain things from artificial, in, from intelligence. Mm-hmm. And that is the subject of analysis. Till now, all business I, I don't like how uh, people consider artificial intelligence. They consider as some codes which imitate activity of human being. Mm-hmm. It is not science. It is applications. You would like mm-hmm. to imitate go ahead. It is very useful and, mm-hmm. and, and good problem. But you need to, 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 to learn something more. How people try to do, how people can to develop, say, uh, predicate swims like a duck or play like butterfly or something like that. Then not, not the teacher says you how it came in his mind, how he chooses this image. So that process. That is problem of intelligence. That is the problem of intelligence. And you see that connected to the problem of learning 
Absolutely. Are they? Because you immediately give this predicate, like a uh, specific predicate, swims like a dog or quack like a dog. It was chosen somehow. So what is the line of work, would you say, if you were to formulate it as a set of open problems, that will take us there? We'll t to play like a butterfly. We'll get a system to be able to... Let's separate two stories. One mathematical story, that if you have predicate, you can do something. And another story, you have to get predicate. It is intelligence problem, and people even did not start understand intelligence. Because to understand intelligence, first of all, try to understand what doing teachers. Half teacher teach. Why one one teacher better than another one? Yeah. So, you you think we really even haven't started on the journey of no. the generating the predicates? No. We don't understand. We even don't understand that this problem exists. Because did you? You hear? do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I I I just <laughs> no name. Yeah. I I want to understand uh, why one teacher better than another, and how affect teacher student it well, is not because he repeating the problem which is in textbook yes. he makes some remarks he makes some philosophy of reasoning you know that's a beautiful so it, it is a formulation of a question that is the open problem why is one teacher better than another right what he does better yeah what 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 why in at every level uh, but people how, how do they get better what does it mean to be better uh, the the whole yeah the, yeah from from whatever model i have yeah one teacher can give a very good predicate one teacher can say uh swims like a dog and another can say jump like a dog and jump like a dog carries zero information <laughs> so what is the most exciting problem in statistical learning you've ever worked on or are working on now? Um, I just finished this invariant story mm -hmm. and I'm happy that I believe that it is ultimate learning story. At least I can show that there are no another mechanism, only two mechanisms. But they separate statistical part from intelligent part. And I know nothing about intelligent part. And if we will know this intelligent part, so it will help us a lot in teaching, in, 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 in learning. In learning. Yeah. Do you so, know we'll know it when we see it? So, for example, in, in my talk, the last slide was the challenge. So you have, say, NIST digit recognition problem. And deep learning claims that they did it uh, very well, say 99.5% of correct answers. But they use 60,000 observations. Yeah. Can you do the same using 100 times less? But incorporating invariants, what it means, you know, digit one, two, three. But yeah. Just looking at that. Explain me which invariant I should keep to use 100 examples or say 100 times less examples to do the same job. Yeah, that sl last slide, in, in uh, unfortunately, your talk ended uh, quickly, but that last slide was uh, a powerful open challenge and a formulation of yeah. the essence. No, that here. is the exact problem of intelligence because. Everybody, when, when machine learning started and it was developed by mathematician, they immediately recognize that we use much more uh, training data than human needed. But now again, we came to the same story. Have to decrease. And that is the problem of learning. It is not like in deep learning, they, they use zillions of training data. Because maybe zillions are not enough if you um, have a good uh, invariance.
maybe you will never collect some number of observations. But now it is a question to, to intelligence how to do that. Because statistical part is ready. As soon as you supply us with predicate, we can do a good job with small amount of observations. And the very first challenge is well-known digit recognition. And you know digits. Mm -hmm. And please tell me invariance. I think about that. I can say for digit three, I would introduce concept of horizontal symmetry. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. the digit three has horizontal symmetry, say more than say digit two or something like that. But as soon as I get the idea of horizontal symmetry, I can mathematically invent a lot of measure of horizontal symmetry or then vertical symmetry or diagonal symmetry, whatever, if I have idea of symmetry. But what else? Looking on, on, on digit, I see that it is meta, meta predicate, which is not shape. It is something like symmetry, like how dark is whole picture, something like that, which, which can self rise a predicate. You think such a predicate could rise out of something that's, uh, not general, meaning it feels like for me to be able to understand the difference between a two and a three, I would need to have had a, a, a childhood of 10 to 15 years playing with kids, going to school, being yelled by parents, all of that, w walking, jumping, looking at ducks, and now, then I would be able to generate the right predicate for telling the difference between two and a three. Or do you think there's a more efficient I way? I don't know. I know for sure that you, you must know something more than digits. Yes. To, to, and that's a to, powerful statement. Yeah. But maybe there are several languages of description, um, these elements of digits. So I talking about symmetry about some symmetry, right. properties of geometry i talking about something abstract i don't know that but this is a problem of, of intelligence so in one of our article it is trivial to show that every example can carry not more than one bit of information in real because uh, when you show example uh, and you say this is one. You can remove, say, a function which does not tell you one. Yeah. Say it's the best strategy. If you can do it perfectly, it's remove half of the functions. But when you use one predicate, which looks like a duck, you can remove much more functions than half. And that means that it contains a lot of bit of information from formal point of view. But when you have a general picture of what you want to recognize, and general picture of the world, can you invent this predicate? And that predicate carry a lot of information. Beautifully put. Maybe just me, but in all the math you show, in your work, uh, which is some of the most profound mathematical work in, in, in the field of learning AI and just math in general. I hear a lot of poetry and philosophy. You, you really kind of um, talk about philosophy of science. You, there's, a, there's a poetry and music to a lot of the work you're doing and the way you're thinking about it. So do you, where does that come from? Do you, do you escape to poetry? Do you escape to music I or not? That, I think <laughs> that there exists grand truths. There exists ground truth. Yeah, and that can be seen everywhere. Yeah. The smart guy, philosopher, sometimes I surprise how they deep see. Sometimes I see that some of them are completely out of subject. Mm -hmm. 
but the ground truth I see in music. Music is the ground truth? Yeah. And in poetry, many poets, they, they believe that they take dictation. <laughs> so what, uh, what piece of music, as a piece of empirical evidence, gave you a sense that they are um, they're touching something in the ground truth? It is structure. The structure of the math. Yeah, because the math of when music. you're listening to Bach, yeah, Bach you yeah. see this structure. Yeah. Very clear, very classic, very simple. Yeah. And the same in mass when you have uh, axioms in geometry, you have the same feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and in poetry, sometimes you see the same. Yeah. Uh, and if you look back at your childhood, you grew up in Russia, you maybe you were born as a researcher in Russia, you've developed as a researcher in Russia, you've came to the United States and in a few places. If you look back, what were what was some of your happiest moments as a researcher? Uh, some of the most profound moments, not in terms of their impact on society, but in terms of their impact on how damn good you feel that day and you remember that moment you know every time when you found something it is great moment in the life every simple things just but my general the... feeling that i most most of my time was wrong you should go again and again and again and, and try to be honest in front of yourself not to make interpretation, but try to, uh, to understand that it related to grand truths. Mm -hmm. It is not my blah, blah, blah interpretation and something like that. But you're allowed to get excited at the, at the possibility of discovery. Oh, yeah. You'll double, you have to double check it, but... Uh... No, but how it related to the other grand truths? Is it just temporary or it is for... Forever. You know, you always have a feeling when you found something, how big is that? So, 20 years ago, when we discovered statistical learning theory, nobody believed, except for one guy, Dudley, from MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 20 years, it became fashion. And the same with support vector machines. That's yeah. kernel machines. So with, with support vector machines, with learning theory, with, when you were working on it, uh, you had a sense? The, you had a sense of the, the, the profundity of it, the how that this, this seems to be right. This seems to be powerful. Right. Absolutely. Immediately. I recognize that it will last forever. And now when I found this invariant story. You feel the so same? I have, a, I have a feeling that it is complete learning because I have proved that there are no different mechanisms. You can have some, uh, say, cosmetic improvement you can do, but in terms of invariance, you need both invariance and statistical learning, and they should work together. But also, I'm happy that uh, we can formulate what is intelligence from that, and to separate from technical part. And that is completely different. Absolutely. Well, Vladimir, thank you so much for talking today. Thank you. It's an honor. What are you?